Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Kilgore. I'm the managing editor of Feeding Grain Magazine and the host of the Feeding Grain Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today as we dive deep into the issues affecting the feed manufacturing, grain handling, and allied industries. Today's episode is brought to you by the Bin Whip and Numat Systems. The powerful dual impact Bin Whip removes the toughest buildup and blockages in industrial storage silos without hazardous silo entry. Learn more today at binwhip.com. Today's episode is the first of a two-parter with Todd and Sargent's Vice President of Project Development, Alex Kerrigan. We're talking about what it's like to start a construction project in the feed manufacturing, grain handling, and processing industries. We discuss what it's like to start a project like this, when to get a contractor, and what information they need to help you build your best project. I hope you enjoy the interview. If you want to help out the podcast and are listening to this in a podcasting app, please rate us and subscribe. Helps out the podcast a lot. If you're listening online, sign up for the Feeding Grain newsletter, Industry Watch, to see the latest podcasts and stay up to date on all of the latest news from around the industry. Now, on to the show. Hi, Alex. Thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate you being here. Yeah, great to be here, Stephen. Thank you very much for the invite. Looking forward to chatting a little bit through the construction or pre-construction items that the customers should think about when building a facility. Yeah, it's a really good topic. I uh, I realized actually when we were we for every, full disclosure to everyone listening, we just uh, Alex and I just met at IPPE and talked a little bit, and I realized like I've known Alex for ten years now, which is kind of crazy to think about. But you're uh, one of our favorite experts on any of this kind of topic. So we really appreciate you sitting down with us. But for anyone who hasn't known you for the past 10 years, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself and what you do at Todd and Sargent? Yeah, I've been at Todd and Sargent. I interned here back in 1998, just in both the the field a little bit and estimating and touch of design over a, a short time period during the summer. It's funny, I graduated college with more of a, a finance or with a finance background and, and wanted to learn more about the inner workings of a, of a private company, the financial side of a private company. And then the more I got around the design piece and the project management piece, I gravitated towards that instead. So I've got an agriculture background. I've been around these smaller facilities for years since I was, oh, I don't know, probably sixth, seventh grade helping my dad out on the farm and also around our grain elevator and, and feed mills locally. From Southern Iowa, a little town called Afton. I still farm down there with our family. We've got a, again, a, a small grain elevator slash dryer system down there. It's kind of nice to just, I don't know, beat around and and understand concepts and equipment in general. And then, of course, I could probably get into my own little, I'll say, owner or project management on uh, small projects down there as well. So, but at any rate, yeah, I've been at Todd and Sargent since 98 intern and, and back in the swing of things in 02 full time. And I've gone anywhere from working on grain elevators and feed mills to more involved processing on, say, soy crush facilities, expeller plants pet food facilities, quite a bit in the biodiesel industry, managing jobs on, on biodiesel and, and a little bit of ethanol work here, gosh, 15, 18 years ago. Quite a bit in the flour milling industry, really enjoy the flour and feed side both. I enjoy these complex facilities that that take a lot of interaction or a, a lot of coordination between owners, the process technologists, and in the, the construction side, be it engineering or construction alike. So. I guess my biggest desire in growing up and what I do today is just organizing facilities to be more efficient. And you know, my love for agriculture is just making things better, whether it's in how we go about constructing or how we go about processing the grain and, and logistically how, how to get it there and how to get finished product out. So it's a little bit about me. Yeah, you, you, you. Yeah, you've been involved in some huge projects over the years. Uh, some of the biggest stories we've ever co covered at Feed and Grain have been Todd and Sargent stories. Um, and it's also really nice to hear that you're still on that hobby farm. <laughs> Are you still you still do that? Because uh, I always remember talking about you around harvest season, and it's you know it's got to be pretty relaxing, right, to be able to go from the to regular, just you know, go down to the farm and get out there on the combine and harvest some grain <laughs> to be a nice respite. Yeah, most people know they're sitting around on the tractor. It gives you gives you time to introspect or sit in the combine, but it also it helps me just 
kick back and relax a little. And, and if, uh, if concepts here at Todd and Sargent or, or design concepts happen to pop into my mind as I'm tooling around out in the middle of the field, it's, it's a nice time for me just to try and envision certain ideas that, that come from a customer or how to implement best practices from a vendor or a good subcontractor that we team up with on a job. And yeah, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy working at Todd and Sargent and all of our teams and, and especially with the owners that we get to interact with. But I also like having that little bit of free time to to think about or, or like I said, just envision what we might construct for a customer as well. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I only understand that from writing where the best way to get rid of writer's block is like to go for a long drive and just kind of think to yourself there in the seat. So I imagine it's similar. Uh, uh, but so we have you on kind of to talk about the beginning process of a facility who might want to upgrade or might be thinking of upgrading, renovating, or building a new site and kind of what information they should start to gather before they talk to someone and when to talk to someone and what to talk to someone like you about. Um, so starting with, uh, so before engaging with a construction company, what kind of essential information should companies really gather to ensure that it's going to be a successful project and that they have everything ready for you to give your input? I guess the few different hats that I wear at Todd and Sargent, you know, we're we're thinking about conceptual design and how to interact with a customer, whether it's just the process design or uh, specifications, just negotiating the final sales package and everything. But some of the things that, that an owner wants to be think, thinking about or what's, uh, as you said, what's the essential information that companies could gather ahead of time. A lot of owners, this goes without saying, they already have this in the back of their mind. But there are some owners that don't consider these items of what's the distance or, or how far away are you, logistically speaking, or what's your access to raw materials and to the backside of it, what's your distance or access to the end user or customer. And what I mean by that is if you're building a feed mill in a particular locale, is it a feed mill that's in close proximity to corn being grown or do you need to bring in everything by rail? And then the second part of it is, or that back end part of it is, is your facility close by where, where you're capable of just throwing something on a truck in bulk or, or maybe bulk bags or just smaller 50 pound bags and sending it over to an end user? Or do you need to be thinking about a much more involved logistical setup of, of loading out rail cars or, or um, it, you know, I mean, it still could be a pretty complex thing to be transloading from, um, uh, I don't know, say it's a into a van trailer versus uh, dumping it into a hopper bottom semi. So the uh, th that's a big thing is understanding the distance, understanding the costs involved. Um, and like I said, I think a lot of customers, they, they have that in mind from the get-go when they're, when they're siting a facility. Uh, the, the other thing though, and these are some of the things that you don't, you, you hope you can just kind of uh, force through if you're an owner maybe, um, or, or at least you hope for the best is uh, do the neighbors, do they want you there? Uh, you know, there's, there have been uh, discussions, you know, complexes in, in Kansas that uh, have been, hey, no, we don't, we don't want you there. Uh, you know, there's that, I think of that export facility down Louisiana, uh, you know, maybe the neighbors don't want you there. Uh, it, it sounds crazy, but, you know, uh, being a good neighbor means a lot. Uh, interacting with the, with the, the local uh, uh Chamber of Commerce or, uh, I'm sorry, economic development means a lot. Um, and you have to just think through that and what state you're thinking about building it or what lo location you're thinking about building it. Will the permitting be an uphill battle that that outweigh or actually outweighs the site's benefits or um, or will everything fall into place and, and um, make your entire process of construction and eventually operation of the facility profitable and, and um and um, I'll say synergistic with the uh, with the locals. Yeah, people really underestimate how important it is to have the community on your side. Um, 
interesting little side story that I might cut from this, but I think is really interesting is I got a, a call from an NPR reporter covering that uh, facility down in Louisiana that there were all those protests for and they're trying not to, to get not built as a little background person, which I was very excited about because I was like, I've never been a background consultant for anybody before. This is fun. And he's asking me all these questions and he's like, well, like, are there concerns about dust and stuff, you know, justified or smell and noise? I'm like, I mean, no, because you can build facilities. I mean, we have equipment to get rid of most dust. We have dust collectors and they're a lot cleaner than they've ever been. Same with noise and same with, uh, you know, air pollution and smell and stuff like that. And then, of course, he used none of that in the article. <laughs> And just kind of was like, yeah, it's going to smell. I'm like, that's not what I said at all. <laughs> uh, and you're right. I mean, there, most everything uh, with a facility in a particular locale can can be mitigated. It's, uh, it, it is a matter of cost, though. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, the cost of a dust system versus no dust system is, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's additional uh, cash that needs to be, uh, or, or a cash outlay for that. For that particular system, and you know, it happens with uh, noise pollution, light pollution, etc. All of those things are are certainly things that can be taken care of uh, with uh, additional cost. But uh, you know, there there's other things besides just the, keeping the locals happy too. Uh, does does the railroad like say if you've got a railroad that you're working with, do they want to service your site? You know, you the biggest thing that we find on at least any project that involves railroad service is the customer starts talking to them uh, maybe three months in advance of wanting to break ground. And that's good that they're talking to them, but you'll find, uh, and, and I think everybody is uh, that's uh, maybe listening is aware that, you know, the, the railroad has, a, they've got a lot of approvals they need to get through. They have a lot of safety checks they want to confirm. They want to make sure the engineering of your facility or, or what uh, their locomotive might be driving across is, is well constructed or well engineered and well thought through, and and so you uh, you want to make sure that the railroad's able to service your site and that they're uh, they, they've given you kind of a an idea of what the timeline will be of when you'll actually be able to to get service. So that that's a big one. Um, obviously, most most everybody listening is aware that the facilities that that are being constructed, be it a feed mill or a grain elevator, an annex storage, flour mill, whatever it may be. These are tall facilities. I mean, uh, grain is stored upright uh, for the for the need of of uh, utilizing minimal space. And uh, with these being tall facilities, you need to be in conversation with the local airport or the FAA to to make sure that uh, there are no objections to your plant location or the height of your um, of your facility or that that uh, you know feed manufacturing plant or, or or whatever you're thinking about building. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And see, these are all things that, especially when you're caught up in the moment, you might kind of just forget about <laughs> until you're you're way more into the thick of things. So at what point should uh, a company really start a dialogue with uh, a company like yours, an engineering design construction company? Um, yeah, so uh, we always say in the feasibility study, it doesn't mean it, uh, it doesn't matter if you're talking to Todd and Sergeant or, or any other contractor out there. You know, the the earlier we can get an idea of what you're thinking about building and some of the uh, uh, the nuance of the nuances of the job or the site itself, uh, the, the smoother things will go. Uh, yeah, if I. If you wanted just a, a package answer of when when you should start, I mean, hell, I've I've worked on facilities where it's been ten years in the making, and then we finally broke ground. I've, I've worked on facilities uh, where uh, the owners had a lot of these uh, these um, ducks in a row, so to speak, already within uh, in within you know four to six months, we're we're breaking ground and working away. Um, you know, the the owner needs to be talking to. Uh, utilities about, uh, you know, whether it's the railroad that I just mentioned, if it's electrical, if it's water, sewer, gas, um, you know, wh what's the water, water quality that's needed for the boiler, um, the, the delivery volume um, for either domestic use or the boiler use or hell, maybe even a fire pump or suppression system. You know, th those are things that they want to be uh, getting done as soon as they possibly can, you know, it, 
that could certainly be uh, something that's a, a year in the making or a year in advance. Um, you need to be thinking through, hey, is my site, is it culturally or environmentally sensitive? Uh, I, I, do I need to get an environmental firm, um, you know, on retainer to start thinking about the, uh, the air permitting? Uh, there, there are a lot of, um, a lot of states and, and provinces out there that, you know, it could be anywhere from six to 12 to, you know, I'll say six to 12 months uh, with the air permitting and, and, you know, certainly other um, environmentally sensitive areas. Like if you have a wetland that needs to be mitigated, um, you know, that could, it could take some time to get those permits in hand, or if it's uh, on a cult culturally sensitive site and you need to get a, uh, cultural resource management company involved to do a survey or, or talk mitigation. You know, that's something that uh, should be thought about a year or two in advance. Um, something I, I guess I threw this out. What I, what I find happens a lot is uh, an owner sees this pristine parcel of land or they're given this pristine parcel of land by a, uh, uh, well, I don't know, say an indus industrial park group or whatever. And it looks great up on top, but there's a lot of things that can happen uh, from a civil design of, you know, how much dirt needs to be moved or, or worse yet, how much needs to be imported from offsite to build up this this my, nice piece of ground. And then, uh, hey, what's going on underground? You know, the, the geotechnical needs, uh, you need, it, it is ideal to get a soils report and, a, you know, a few soil borings done as soon as you're able, just so you know what you're getting into with this particular parcel. You know, you might think you're buying it for 3000 bucks an acre and it's, uh, hey man, that seems pretty cheap versus 10000 And then you, you realize, oh my gosh, this soil underneath is, uh, is nothing but mucky silt or fat clays and it's going to force me into, you know, a million, million and a half dollars worth of piling or something. Um, th those, are, those are things that you... You usually say to a construction company, "Hey, I, I just want to get a price on this facility," um, but you don't. You don't always think through what might be underground and, and how how you have to support these these massive structures. Yeah, and I'm sure, especially with people who haven't like done a new project in a long time. I mean, all those regulations and all those things have, I assume, gotten more strict, <laughs> and also uh, probably take a lot longer than people think they're going to. Which is, you know, bureaucracy of governments on all levels. Yeah, and you know that that's a uh, like you said, Steve. That's that's on the you know more of the. Um, uh, authorities having jurisdiction or, or servicing uh, folks, but you also have a lot of interaction, not just with a Todd and Sergeant type group uh, or construction group. You got a lot of interaction with your your uh, industry partners, like a technology provider. You know, if it's a it's if it's a brand new greenfield site flour mill, you, you know, you, there's probably a uh, a lot to be discussed with uh, a process technologist of what your outputs are and, and how you're going to fit it around, and that's going to that's going to determine what the footprint is of your actual uh, structure to, to house all this equipment. You know, if you get a feed mill, that's uh, a little, you know, 30 by 40 footprint uh, for an ingredient uh, bin tower and a little 30 by 40 footprint uh, or 20 by 40 footprint, maybe for uh, the loadout lanes. That's one thing. If you're looking at a, a big old feed mill with three pelleting lines and more like a, you know, 50 by 60 ingredient tower and, and uh, you know, two or three loadout lanes and uh, say a couple million bushels of grain storage. I mean, that, that's a lot. That, it, it, and that's just, uh, you know, that's just the footprints. You, you still have to determine what's needed for the traffic flow around that facility and what you need for roadways and, and how you interact with the civil engineer to determine um, not just uh, how much dirt needs to be moved, but how you actually move water across the site, what, uh, what drainage is necessary to, to, um, to have a long lasting site that, that, um, you know, you're, you're happy with for, for a hundred years to come. So. Hello again, it's me, Steven, just hopping back in at this point to let you know, the second part of this interview will be coming next week, but until then, thank you for listening and stay safe out there. <laughs>